everyone and welcome. My name is Amy Kuhn. I'm chair of the Metro Region Coalition and also the Town Council in Falmouth. We have a good number of attendees today. Thank you all very much for making time to join us for um, this discussion. Um, today's event is designed to educate attendees about the local, regional, and state aspects of the homelessness crisis facing our region. With a more detailed understanding of how homelessness is a problem that impacts all of our communities, we're hoping to spark thinking and dialogue about the best ways for communities to respond. Attendees will have the chance to ask questions during the forum and to take what they learn back to their own communities for more discussion, which GP COG can support. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Liz Cotter Schlacks, who is the president and CEO of United Way Greater Portland. Thank you, Liz. Thank you so much, Amy. And um, thank you so much to GP COG and to Christina and Chris um, for arranging the forum today. Um, and thank you so much too to Tom for your technical expertise on the back end here. Um, I'm so glad to be able to be with you all today to discuss this really important and growing challenge for all of us in the region. And we're here today, I hope, because we believe that homelessness is solvable. And um, we also know, though, that that's going to take cross-sector work and partnership. And it's also going to take regional work and um, not just the work of any one community it will actually take all of us, frankly, working together. Um, you know, we, we start looking at what the root causes of homelessness are, and uh, that list can get pretty long pretty quickly. Um, it's driven, as many of you who know way more about the topic than I do, would say, you know, by sort of maybe the more obvious factors of um, a lack of affordable housing or um, it, you know, uh, lack of employment or underemployment um, and not having sufficient income. But there are also many less obvious um, factors such as addiction, mental health is issues, domestic violence, trauma, the PTSD that can come with trauma. Um, so the, the causes get really deep and really complex. But with a coordinated regional or statewide effort using data, um, we really believe that we can better understand and address the causes of homelessness and be able to move forward um, as a state. Um, you know, we can, we can address those complex needs that um, folks who are living in crisis in many cases um, have. And uh, we know that many of the people who are experiencing homelessness um, have other services that they need besides just shelter. And so we have the potential working together to improve resources for these people, um, the most, many of them the most vulnerable members of our community, while at the same time potentially reducing costs and reducing duplication of services again, if we, if we work together. Um, I think I was asked here today because um, many organizations in our community, including GPCOG, are working together to solve some very large challenges by focusing on three 10-year goals for Greater Portland called Thrive 2027. And United Way of Greater Portland is the sort of coordinating organization for this work. Um, and Thrive 2027 has shown already in its three years um, of work that if we work together, we can have measurable positive impact on issues that seem intractable, like homelessness. But it also shows Thrive 2027 that we need to deal with both the urgent and people who need shelter today and tonight um, at the same time as we're trying to address these root causes of homelessness and preventing future homelessness. Um, and that takes planning and it takes partnership and no one entity, no government, no nonprofit organization, even no, not one sector um, can do this alone. It really takes all of us listening and working together and it also includes the very important voices of those who are experiencing homelessness. 
So as I suspect we'll hear today, our solutions um, need to reflect the complexity of this issue and the urgency of this issue. And um, I wish that simple solutions could make a difference, but we all know, and many people who have been working um, diligently against this issue for many years can tell you simple just doesn't work. So today I think will be a great discussion because we have experts, practitioners, leaders who are fighting homelessness every single day. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing their perspectives. I'll introduce you to them and then you'll have a chance to hear from each of them um, about their experiences fighting homelessness and their perspectives on the way forward. And then afterward, we'll have a chance for Q&A for any of the panelists and some discussion. So first, you'll hear from John Jennings. John Jennings became city manager for the city of Portland in 2015 after serving as assistant city manager for the city of South Portland for two years. In 2010, John brought the team now known as the Red Claws to Portland and served as president and general manager. Prior to his service with the Red Claws, John worked in politics and basketball. Ran for Congress in Indiana and served as a White House fellow and key staffer in the Clinton administration. In basketball, he was in coaching and management positions for the Pacers and the Celtics. John holds a bachelor's from Indiana University and a master's in public administration from Harvard. As city manager, John is the chief administrative officer for the city. He's responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of 13 departments and 1,400 employees. After John, we'll hear from Dan Brennan, who became main housings director in 2018 after serving in a number of senior staff positions since 1993, including as senior director of programs, director of energy and housing services, director of development, director of asset management and internal auditor. I think Dan held every leadership position in the agency before leading it. Prior to joining Maine Housing, Dan was employed as an internal auditor for Maine National Bank and Recall Management Corporation. Dan has earned the certi certified internal auditor designation and he received his BA from the University of Maine and his MBA from Thomas College. And third, you'll hear from Dana Totman. Dana became the president and CEO of Avesta Housing in 2000. Dana has received numerous state and local awards and recognitions, but perhaps most appropriate for today's discussion, Dana received the Maine State Housing Authority's Affordable Housing Lifetime Achievement Award in 2017. In fact, before joining Avesta, Dana was the deputy director of Maine State Housing Authority from 1994 to 2000. He has a BA in public management from the University of Maine and an MBA from Southern New Hampshire University. So John, Dan and Dana will each have about 15 minutes more or less to share their information with you and then we'll move to Q&A. If you have any questions for the panel that as the panels are going on, please make a note to ask later if you want to speak your question yourself. Um, or you can also, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's that Q&A piece down at the bottom, you can type questions in there if you prefer to have me ask the question on your behalf. Um, and whichever you prefer is fine with us, but just don't put your questions in the chat because if you guys all wanna chat and catch up and make plans for the weekend, that's the place for the chat. Um, and I don't wanna try to fish questions out of there. So um, whatever you prefer, you can raise your hand and, and ask it yourself or just type it into that Q&A box at the bottom. So let's get going. So John, could you tell us please about the current situation in Portland? Well, first of all, Liz, I wanna thank you for hosting uh, this forum. Um, and also obviously I wanna thank GP Cog, uh, who, who continue to do a great great work for the, uh, the region. I'm honored to be on the same panel as Dan and Dana. Um, I do wanna mention though, that while I'm on here for the city of Portland, there's another individual that I believe may be in the, on the call, uh, who is uh, as much, if not more responsible for what we've been trying to do on homelessness for the last several years, and that's Councillor Belinda Ray. Uh, Councillor Ray has just done an amazing job. Uh, it's her passion. Um, and we have worked collaboratively together along with uh, many others, of course, and the other councillors and 
Mayor uh, Kate Snyder, um, you know, our new mayor, um, or she's not a new mayor any longer. She's been with us for a year now. So, um, and we've all been very, very focused on on how to end homelessness uh, in the city of Portland. For me, this goes back to 2011, 2010, 2011 with some of you that's on the call. Uh, I was asked to be uh, one of the co-chairs of the task force to end homelessness with uh, Liz, actually your predecessor, Suzanne McCormick and Dory Waxman. And through that process, I learned a great, more, a great deal more about what was going on in Portland well before I even entertained the idea of becoming city manager. Um, I did at that time and continue to think that the Oxford Tree Shelter is, is not something that uh, the city uh, is either proud of or, you know, frankly, we can just do, do much better, which is why Belinda, Ray, and I and others have been working so hard to try to build a new homeless services center that is a comprehensive approach to, um, to homelessness. So it's not just a building. There's a beating heart that will be in that building uh, with many um, of our uh, community uh, partners that we interact with. We have a, a weekly meeting with 12 different partners um, and four different city departments to discuss homelessness in Portland and, and planning. We are in touch with many of those nonprofits and community partners on a daily basis, uh, multiple times actually. And so there's a lot of work that's been going on uh, with the goal of getting us to this homeless services center that will provide all of the wraparound services, Liz, that you were kind of articulating as the some of the symptoms of homelessness. And so uh, we're very, very excited. The only thing holding us back uh, is funding for that uh, homeless services center, which I hope we can kind of get into on that as well. Um, currently in Portland, I just want to give you some numbers. Currently in Portland, and, and I want to differentiate between the family shelter, which is which is run by the city, and uh, the Oxford Street Shelter, which is also, um, as I think we all know, the city stepped up when others didn't um, to um, provide additional shelter during both the pandemic as well as the all the families that came to Portland uh, a year plus ago from the southern border. So just on the family shelter, just to start off with, um, you know, we have uh, three buildings that we house families in. Um, and we had last night, we had 35 families, uh, which equaled 110 individuals. Uh, now, we also are continue to see people coming and families coming from all over the country, but also mostly the southern border. Uh, so we have had to expand capacity beyond the, the family shelter buildings to 32. We have, um, we have in hotels, we have 32 families, which equals 103 uh, individuals. So we have uh, 67 families um, in the city of Portland that the city is uh, taking responsibility for. Um, and honestly, thanks to the governor, Governor Mills, she made the change last year that allowed um, the uh, asylum seekers to uh, apply uh, for general assistance. And that was a huge step uh, for, for these, uh, many of these families that have come to uh, the city. And then just switching to the emergency shelter, the Oxford Street Shelter. Um, as we, so we have always had a capacity of, uh, at Oxford Street of about 154 individuals. Well, because of uh, what we're experiencing right now with the pandemic, we've had to cut that in half. So we have a 75 person capacity now at Oxford Street. Last night, we had 74 individuals at Oxford Street. Um, and then we had opened up the uh, Portland Exposition Building uh, to help with the overflow of individuals because we had to reduce the capacity of, of, the, uh, of Oxford Street. We opened up the Expo um, and we had uh, 50 plus individuals in the Expo. It was actually between 30 and 50 consistently over the summer and into the fall. 
But a few weeks ago, we had to uh, move everyone out of the expo uh, because of the fact that the expo is a voting um, a booth or a voting uh, uh, place in the city, as well as we have tenant obligations uh, through uh, both the schools as well as um, the, the Red Claws and others who use the building. We were able to move all of those individuals into hotel into, into one hotel uh, at this time. We're still working with the county uh, county county manager uh, Jim Gailey had generously offered uh, the use of the Joyce House, um, and unfortunately, we have not been able to come to an agreement yet due to some insurance issues. Um, but we're still working with Jim and others at the county to try to make that happen um, because that would offer about 50, uh, an opportunity for 55 people uh, to be able to be in single rooms. Um, but we, I also just wanna mention that we have, in addition to the 74 um, that's at Oxford Street, the 54 that is at another hotel, we have 198 other individuals who are in four other hotels uh, that we are um, also providing emergency shelter to, as well as uh, wrap, uh, wraparound services. Um, so those are kind of the, the hard data numbers. Um, we, since October 1st, um, the city of Portland has completed um, 70 new updates or intakes uh, for, um, for our shelters. Uh, and so 46% of those individuals of those 70 updates, 70 updates or intakes, uh, come from outside of the city of Portland. So 46% of those new individuals come from outside the city of Portland. Um, and then finally, um, one of the, uh, areas that we're most proud of in terms of um, our commitment to ending homelessness and helping the most vulnerable individuals in our community is our housing program. And so some years ago, the city decided to put additional resources into getting people housed, which is one of the key stabilizers in people's lives. And so just since um, July 1st, the uh, out of Oxford Street, uh, we have been able to place 28 people uh, into permanent stable housing. Um, and that total bed nights uh, from the housing placements from July, uh, July 1st is uh, 7,648 bed nights. Um, so, and then on the family shelter side, uh, since July 1st as well, we've been able to place 38 families, which equals a total of 137 individuals uh, within the, on that family. So um, in my position, I am so fortunate to be able to work with some of the most um, inspiring and incredible people um, that I've ever had the honor to work with. Um, Aaron Geyer, Kristen Dow, Sarah Flaunt, um, many, many others uh, who work every single day uh, to make sure that our most vulnerable are taken care of. Uh, and so that's the current state of where we are in Portland and I look forward to um, further discussion. Great, thank you. Um, again, any questions, please put them in the Q&A box there or hold them on a notepad for afterward. Um, and we'll go on to Dan. Uh, Dan, can you tell us about Maine Housing's work and um, how are you involved with the issue of homelessness at the statewide level? And what do you think is our way forward as a state? Sure, yeah, well, thank you very much, Liz. Um, thank you for asking me to be part of this panel. It's always good to see you, John, and, and you, Dana. Um, I, I think that the convening of this group today is an example of what we at the state think regions need to be doing. Um, convening important um, uh, members of the community and, and municipal leaders together to, to help solve some of these issues. So I thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> so Maine Housing is involved in homelessness in many different ways and I'll, I'll kind of 
talk a little bit about pre-COVID and then dive into what we've been doing uh, during uh, the pandemic. But um, for, for the last 20, 25 years, Maine Housing has been uh, an allocator of, of state and federal resources out to homeless shelters. Uh, there are about 40 homeless shelters throughout the state, about 25 uh, different organizations. And um, so we get, we get federal money, we get state money, we get uh, money directly from Maine Housing and uh, we provide help, uh, the shelters provide operating assistance for their shelters. In some cases, we're a huge part of their budget. In other cases, uh, we're, we're just a small part. But we have interactions and relationships with all of these shelters throughout the state uh, for many, many years. Uh, we administer uh, rental assistance programs through the federal government and the state as well um, for uh, people who are homeless. And so we've been very much involved with the continuum of care and the statewide homeless council and um, uh, the issue of homelessness is, is core to our function and, uh, and to our mission. So uh, in March, uh, COVID arrives. And one of the things that uh, we quickly uh, experienced is something that we've, we've known it, it, COVID didn't really teach us uh, what we didn't already know, but it just highlighted the fact that our shelters were immediately um, overwhelmed with the immediate need to physically distance their populations. And uh, the shelter systems throughout Maine just were not designed uh, for, for that type of, of service delivery. And so we had to act very, very quickly. Um, and, and that, uh, you know, the, obviously the epicenter of, of the, one of the biggest issues in the state was in Portland. And what John uh, described and the, the work that he and his team have done uh, has been uh, fantastic. And, um, but uh, we were in a reactive mode. Um, now, fortunately, through the CARES Act, we received uh, you know, several million dollars of funds from the federal government and through FEMA and uh, the money that came from the state through the Coronavirus Relief Fund um, to help stand up many uh, supports for shelters. So we immediately launched a, a shelter grant program where we funneled uh, uh, these dollars out to the shelters so that they could uh, do what they needed to do, hire overnight staff or hire more people, um, find other physical locations, just the, the basic operations of uh, uh, disinfectants and sanitizers and PPE. So our shelters had to just react immediately to this. So we, we stood up a grant program for, for those shelters. And that still exists now. And each month we're funding those to the shelters uh, throughout the state. Um, we stood up, uh, we helped, we, I should say we helped, we certainly didn't do all the work, uh, standing up these temporary wellness shelters, the one in Portland, first with the uh, University of Southern Maine and, and Preble Street for the uh, resource, uh, the, um, the uh, Sullivan Gym. And then as John mentioned, the city was right there with the Portland Expo and that facility didn't become uh, no longer available. Um, just other temporary locations, uh, Portland, Lewiston, uh, up in Aroostook County as well. And, and so we, uh, and now that's sort of transitioning more to the use of hotels as we head into the fall and we head into the, the winter. That work unfortunately is gonna to have to continue on as, as the pandemic continues and the need is still there. In addition to that, we needed to provide funding for people who either, either needed to isolate or quarantine. Uh, and, and that was another use of, of monies going out to hotels. So Maine Housing has many contracts with hotel owners and service providers to uh, provide a safe place for people to stay in a setting that is properly managed so that, that uh, the, uh, the stress and tensions that sometimes arise uh, uh, during this can, can, can be properly managed and people can get the help that they need. Um, we've engaged in a lot of discussion with municipal leaders, as well as other state officials. Um, our uh, working relationship with Commissioner Lambrew and the folks from the Department of Health and Human Services has never been better in, in my years here at Maine Housing. Um, the, um, the, inter the seamless sort of discussion between the governor's office, DHHS, other parts of state government, Maine Housing is probably the best it's ever been. So that is nice. That, that helps us coordinate, make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and then finally, as many of you know, we, we 
put a tremendous amount of money into short-term rental assistance. Uh, this helps both landlords and tenants during the pandemic. A total of over $17 million uh, has been put forward towards that effort. Um, and just to give you some sense of demand as we, we, we initially had to shut our program down at the end of September because the demand was so high. And then we begin to learn how many people work their way through the system and actually get rental assistance. And so we learned from that, we stood the program back up at the beginning of November. And in the last week, nearly 3000 applications have come in for rental assistance. So those are, those are sort of all short term pandemic related crisis management approach. But when we step back, we've got to keep our eye towards uh, a better way to do these, uh, a better way to handle this, not only in the greater Portland area, but also in the areas and regions around the state. John mentioned 46% of the people coming into Portland uh, are from outside of Portland. And just, you know, that's, that's a very telling data point. Um, what we want to do, I mean, housing is be part of a solution where there are other regions throughout the state that can uh, receive the support and uh, create systems in their local areas that might be able to take the pressures off the Portlands and the Bangors and the Lewiston, which are experiencing the, uh, the real crunch. Um, so I, I guess that's really where the long term is focused. Working, uh, the Statewide Homeless Council is engaged with uh, folks from the Corporation for Supportive Housing. They're engaged in this dialogue of how do we get from where we are to uh, where we need to be as a state. This discussion today is the, around the greater Portland area. And what we need in the greater Portland area is the same type of approach that we need in all the other areas of the state. And it's being evidenced by discussions like today where important uh, local officials, service providers are getting together and talking about what are the strengths and weaknesses in the greater Portland area and how can we continue to work in this particular area to make the system uh, stronger for, for everybody. Um, so I think I'll, I'll stop there um, and, and um, pass it off to Dana, but we're, uh, we're committed to being part of both the short-term and the long-term solutions. So I thank you again for uh, inviting us in here today to talk. That's great. Thank you, Dan. And a uh, reminder, put your questions in the Q&A if you got anything for Dan um, or jot them down and we'll ask them. Um, so finally, in this sort of the first presentation part, um, we've got Dana. And I understand Dana also has AV um, visuals here for us. So we'll, we'll get to see his PowerPoint, I think. Um, but Dana, while we're pulling that up, can you talk about um, affordable and supported housing? And um, maybe you'd like to also start with some thoughts on the most recent referendum in Portland, uh, if you're willing to share your thoughts there. Sure, Liz, um, and, and thanks for moderating this. And, and I wanted to thank uh, GP Cog. Um, the first sort of reaction here is I have no idea how John Jennings dodged the referendum question and it's somehow in, in my lap, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll get to that last if, if that's okay. Um, um, I really um, just have three slides that I'm going to, to uh, mix in here as I go along. You know, I was thinking about this quite a bit and, and it was really, I've been involved in homeless issues since the uh, late eighties. And, and in the late 80s, I became the treasurer of the uh, Tedford shelter in uh, Brunswick. And, and I learned real quickly that we didn't have enough money to do what we were trying to do. And, and that's what I learned in the 80s. We didn't have enough money to help the homeless people with their needs. And so it hasn't changed a whole lot between the late 80s and, and, and now. Uh, in the 90s, when I was at Maine State Housing Authority, I uh, chaired the Interagency Task Force on Homelessness, and we spent a lot of time realizing how difficult it is to pull the various uh, resources together. And since coming to Avesta, we've done our best to, to help homeless persons, and um, I was fortunate to participate with John on that task force as we really did dig in and, and try to come up with ways that were better than the, the, what we had at that point. But the one thing that I, I just, 
come away with time and time again when I, I think about homelessness is the individuals that are homeless. Um, I think we time and time again underestimate the challenges that really exist in their lives. Uh, Liz, you highlighted them at the beginning, but it's just whether it's physical health, substance abuse, mental health, transportation, education, generations of living in poverty, the, the myriad of challenges that so many folks have uh, when they're homeless um, makes it very, very difficult. And this isn't a, a case where we simply put a roof over somebody's head and, and send them off and hope they find a job and all will be well. It just doesn't work that way. The needs of the homeless are really incredible. And I think we can uh, uh, never fully get our arms around with just how difficult their lives are. Um, so that sort of suggests that it's complicated, but then when I back up, you know, this isn't really that complicated. I mean, we're really simply trying to put roofs over people's heads and provide support while they're living under those roofs. That's all we're trying to do. And it doesn't really matter if they're in a shelter, we want staff support and, and guidance for them, or if they're living in supportive housing or housing first developments, we want that appropriate level of support or whether or not they're mainstreamed into regular housing, we want that support. So it's, it's really kind of simple, um, but I think the challenge has always been is how do we really get that support uh, aligned with, uh, with the roof that they happen to be under. Um, so it's on the one hand, it's very simple. Um, we know they have huge challenges. Um, and, and we know what it takes. It takes support and it takes roofs over their heads. And, and that's what we need to do. Um, so so uh, Chris Hall had asked me if I'd talk a little bit about the production of supportive housing and uh, that, that's occurred uh, around the area here. And I thought maybe I should take a look at the production of affordable housing overall um, and take a look at Cumberland County. And so this is one of those three um, uh, slides I wanted to share with you. Um, the the uh, line in blue is the um, number of affordable housing units that are completed uh, each year uh, in Maine going back to 2014. So um, you can see there really aren't, this is statewide. And so we're really not producing very many affordable housing units in the state of Maine, whether it's you know 150 to 300 it, it's simply not very many. Um, Dan and I talk about this all too often and uh, he knows that we should be at between 500 and 1,000. We need 22,000 affordable housing units in the state. We just got to pick this number up to have any meaningful impact on helping, um, helping people with their affordable housing challenges. Uh, Portland gets, um, uh, a, a Cumberland County um, gets a pretty good share of that statewide number, as you can see in the uh, dotted blue line there. Um, and, and I do want to point out there's going to be a pretty good bump up here in uh, the last quarter um, of this year and the first quarter of next year. There's a couple hundred affordable housing units under construction that will come online here in Portland alone. And so there's, there's progress being made. But nevertheless, it's a giant leap that we, we need to, to uh, uh, climb. Uh, and then the supportive housing is very, very small numbers down on the bottom in the gray. Um, you know, there's a handful uh, each year on average. Uh, there was a big jump there in 2017. 30 of those 42 were when we opened our uh, Houston Commons um, Housing for Us development in Portland. So again, the production is um, uh, disappointing, and I think um, we all know that that needs to, to go up. Um, so I guess if I, I switch gears a little bit and want to look at um, what's going on here at uh, Avesta, how we really help um, uh, our folks, um, maybe we can move that slide along here now. But um, I think you know, we do two things here at Avesta. We have about 400 individuals that we've mainstreamed into our affordable housing. We have about 300,000 units. And, all, and in general, our affordable housing that's created 10 to 15% of the residents, I think this is true across the state, are uh, formerly homeless. And so we mainstream a lot into that housing. 
So the 400 that we've mainstreamed here in um, uh, Southern Maine, mostly Cumberland County, uh, about two thirds, three quarters are new Mainers, immigrants, asylum seekers, and uh, we have great luck. Uh, they don't need a lot of support. This may be folks that came through like that were at the expo a couple summers ago, or folks coming out of the family shelter. We have a lot of uh, new Mainers that enter our housing that are homeless. But then any, any other time, we also have a hundred or so that are individuals that have moved into our housing and they tend to need a higher level of support. And so um, we know that, um, uh, again, the, uh, the number of folks um, that we're helping is, is significant, but their support needs are, are big. The three uh, housing first projects we've done are, are pictured here. Logan Place, Florence House, Houston Commons. These have been great successes. We took the most chronically uh, homeless, uh, challenged folks among the entire homeless population, and they moved into these facilities. And uh, we've had great luck. The encounters with the, the police and emergency rooms has gone down 80% and has just been wonderfully successful. And um, we'd like to do more and more of these. But I really want to point out to why I think they're successful. And that is that uh, we have two full-time staff, actually uh, Preble Street employs those individuals that are in these facilities around the clock. And so when you have two staff for 30 people um, or one staff uh, for 15, actually three staff for 15 because there's three shifts, when you have ratios like that, um, good things happen. And so again, this just demonstrates that it really takes people to provide help to people. And um, when you have good numbers, you have good results. Uh, I would say similarly, the Veterans Homeless Challenge here around the country has had great success in the last uh, three, four years, largely because there were major investments made where those caseloads got smaller and the outcomes got, got better. So, so again, um, I think these are uh, three successes. You know, there's uh, 85 people living in these three developments, all chronically homeless. And we've uh, literally saved, saved their lives and saved a lot of uh, money by keeping them out of the emergency room um, and um, out, of, out of the jails. Um, so again, I think this isn't that, that complicated. It's trying to align those services to, to the housing. And as Dan said, they're spending a lot of time uh, at main housing talking to DHHS, and that's exactly what, what has, to, uh, has to happen. Um, but there's another thing that I think sort of is a, a policy question that, you know, beyond creating more affordable housing that we want to take a look at. And that is, there's a whole lot of people that are right on the edge of homelessness, and we really need to do our best to keep them from falling into the ranks of, of homeless. Um, I think sometimes we forget how poor our population is. And so uh, maybe if I could look at that other slide I had there. Um, what is very, very striking is this is the uh, number of households in Portland, South Portland and Westbrook. Uh, there's 19,900 uh, households. Uh, and 8,900, the top row of them are very, very poor. These are people that we consider extremely low income. Uh, these are people that are generally making ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a year. And uh, uh, amazingly, well over half of that population, um, these are the folks at our house, they're not the homeless, uh, they're paying over half that meager income toward, toward housing. So the, the circle in red there, I think, is the number that scares me more than anything else, that we got um, 5,796 households in Portland, South Portland, and Westbrook that are paying more than half their income um, on, uh, on rent. And, and that just is not sustainable. So that is a group that absolutely we need to focus on to move into our affordable housing. The affordable housing we do create in general um, uh, tends to help people more in that 30, 60% range, and that's the color in blue. Again, there's a lot of them. And again, we're help creating two, 300 units a year, of which you know, some are here in Cumberland County. 
So those are really just big, big numbers. And we got to create more affordable options for um, that group in the red circle and the group in the blue circle. And um, the last thing, just a, a little bit, I don't want to get on a, a, a political soapbox here, but um, sometimes I think we forget as policymakers, and there's been a lot of discussion lately about the missing middle. Uh, the missing middle is, is really that group in green. And um, you know the the assumption is with the missing middle is well we're 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 taking care of the bottom and we're taking care of the top. Um, it's the middle that was missing out on, and and I guess I take a little exception to that. Not that the middle doesn't deserve some attention, but if we're going to call the middle missing, what do we really call the bottom? Um, lost, forgotten. Um, <laughs> there are so many, 5,796 is just a big number and we can't forget about them. And so I, I, I just want us all to be thinking about that group when we're thinking about policy and, and allocating resources as the most vulnerable group. Um, the last thing I'll uh, mention um, on, on the referendums, and this will be uh, brief, and, uh, you know, the three that concern me are minimum wage, uh, rent control, and uh, the Green New Deal. Um, I think the Green New Deal will certainly result in far less housing being built. I think market developers will not be able to uh, make it work if they have to uh, have 25% of their um, uh, housing units be to, for people with 80%. The numbers just don't work. So I think there'll be a, a, a slowdown of uh, production on the market side. On the affordable side, we oftentimes uh, need TIFs and the city is great with providing support that get our projects started and then Dan finishes them off with his financing. Um, you know, getting general contractors to build our housing that are willing to uh, adapt to a, a prescribed apprenticeship program that is much more common for Boston area union companies. Uh, we don't think the general contractors and they tell us won't participate. So we think we're going to have a trouble building affordable housing. Um, and uh, rent control um, and, and minimum wage, I think, have their own uh, flaws. Uh, rent control, I think, will lead to a, a, some um, switches from uh, rental to condominium to, to avoid it. And um, again, that's going to decrease that supply. Um, and then on the, the minimum wage, I think there's two problems that there's going to be probably some restaurants or, or retail shops close, um, close up and there'll be some minimum wage or low wage workers uh, thrown out of work and, and that's not going to help. As well, some of the entry level supportive housing providers around the, the uh, city are paying their employees um, uh, less than $18 an hour because their main care reimbursement is, is, is not enough to pay more. So uh, they too are going to be challenged. So I think, you know, beyond the fact, my, my guess is all the refer at least these three referendums will probably have their own legal challenges. Um, but nevertheless, when, when they do play out, I think they're going to be difficult for, for our issues. So um, uh, that's, that's really all I have to, to say here. I guess the important thing is we got a lot, a lot of people with a lot, a lot of needs. Um, I am encouraged. I just saw um, a bit of a blueprint that was being kicked around between the National Low Income Housing Coalition and the Biden administration that does target um, exactly the people we're here to talk about this morning and providing more help for them. So I am encouraged uh, going forward. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dana. And thank you, Sarah, for your slideshow prowess. Um, great, so audience members, it is your turn. And we do have a few questions in the chat. Um, one of them um, I'm gonna start with, it was also a question um, I wanted to ask. So thank you, Tom Hall. Um, who asks, and I, I think I'll go to you, Dana, on this because you mentioned the term. Can you explain what Housing First is? What does that approach entail? And sort of married with that, we had a question from Kathy Breen. Thank you so much for joining us. 
um, of how much does a unit of housing first cost per year? So if you could sort of describe what it is and, and how, um, how much it costs, that would be great. Sure. Um, the housing first as a concept is the idea that you provide housing to homeless persons first and, and once their life is stabilized a little bit by having a roof over their head and a place to park their belongings during the day, you then can start to engage them in, in other services because housing is just the most debilitating uh, aspect in their, their life that when you literally have no place to um, put your stuff or sleep or have an address, um, you need to deal with that first. And so that the concept is, and, and the other side of that is you, there's not a lot of barriers. Uh, traditionally, um, housing, a lot of the old housing, you might have to be sober or you had to agree to participate in this program or that program. Uh, and that's not with housing for us. The idea with housing first is housing comes first and then you'll provide sort of the services um, along with it. Uh, our housing for us, we did it on a project-based system where we have 30 people in these, these developments. And again, we took some of the most challenging uh, uh, long-term folks that lived on the streets forever and ever and ever. And we provided them the housing. Um, and uh, uh, amazingly, um, their lives got better. Some of them started to see a doctor maybe for the first time in years or uh, may have regained some sort of uh, relationship with their family or started uh, um, getting mental health services or maybe they stopped drinking or drinking less. And so it really demonstrated that once housed, um, they took better care of themselves. Again, this is not a healthy group. They're, they're not gonna rush back to work or, or you know, the main reason people have left Logan Place and our other uh, housing first developments is death that they've died, um, that um, you know, they've lived very hard lives. Uh, the second reason they leave is to go to a long-term care nursing home facility. So again, that kind of describes the frail existence of sort of the long-term chronic homeless uh, folks. Um, Senator Breen to the, the question of, of how much it cost, um, we, we, we build it like we build all affordable housing, putting together this um, stacks of, of money with tax credits and uh, fed home block grants and various layers of money. Um, and it costs around $200,000 or so a unit to build this type of housing. Um, but then to operate it, um, there's two uh, uh, major cost to operating it. One, we need to heat, maintain, uh, take care of the building, uh, work with the, the residents, do our property management. Uh, that costs about $6,000 per uh, resident per year. Uh, and that is paid for primarily by the voucher income that each of the residents get. The Portland Housing Authority has been a great partner and they've provided vouchers. So that takes care of our part as the property managers. The expensive part and the most difficult nut to crack has been, um, Preble, Preble, in this case, Preble Street or whoever the service provider is, where do they get their monies to pay for those two, uh, two staff that we think are critical to the success of this program? Um, and that's been the, the most difficult part. For, for the first one, we got money through a HUD uh, special program that no longer exists. For the second one, it was a line item that John Baldacci put in the budget and that uh, Houston Commons, they've cobbled together a, a bunch of different monies. So it's that uh, service money that's the hardest part. So hopefully that kind of answers the, the question as I understand it. Thank you. And um, earlier in, in his remarks, um, John Jennings mentioned um, Belinda Ray, Councilor Ray, and um, she has a couple of thoughts and questions on here. And I'm wondering if um, you would be willing to sort of share those out loud. I, I don't think you're too shy about talking in front of people. So wondering if that would be okay to put you on the spot to share your, your thoughts out loud. So I think we'll need to promote you. I think there, there we go to, uh, to a speaker. Is that all magic? Yes, it's magically happening. 
patience, my friends. And yes, for those of you while we're waiting um, for that to happen, um, you can raise your hand on the participant list. So if you would like to speak um, directly, you can um, raise your hand there. And are we ready with Councillor Ray? I think so. Can you hear Great. me? Yes. Okay. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I thought John did a great job giving his overview at the start of this. I wanted to thank him for that. And I just wanted, one of the things I wanted to point out is that the numbers he gave demonstrate that there were 539 people being served by the city of Portland last night. But that doesn't represent the entire population of people experiencing homelessness in Portland because we have some other shelter facilities as well. So you need to add in another 20 beds at a domestic violence um, shelter. You need to add in another 20 at a teen shelter. You need to add in another 30 at Florence House and, and 30 or 40 at Milestone. Um, so I'm wondering from Dan Brennan, if you know how many people are homeless across the state of Maine on a nightly basis, because I, I do believe the city of Portland uh, and particularly the city, as in the taxpayers with assistance from the state are providing service for more than 50% of the people that go homeless in Maine, despite being only 5% of the population of the state of Maine. Hi, Belinda. Yes, I think your numbers are, are just about right. There is a, an annual count that is uh, done. They call it a point in time count. And, and that number has been roughly on any given night in, in Maine, uh, you know, 1,200, 1,100, 1,200, 1,300 in that, in that range. Um, so you're, you're right on uh, in terms of uh, homelessness around our state. Again, a point in time is just a snapshot. I think our numbers would show that any any time uh, throughout the year, there are about between 6,000, you know, maybe as high as 7,000 people that go through the 40 shelters that are in the state. So, um, but your point about the concentration uh, of the issue uh, in, in, uh, in Portland is, is, uh, is right on. Thanks. And the other thing, I know you're not going to give me free reign, so I'll, I'll limit myself to one more question here. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to make sure we, we really talked about, both John Jennings and Dana Totman mentioned this because they were both part of that 2011 task force. And that was a great task force. It had a wide representation across the community. It included people from uh, Dana from Avesta. It included the Opportunity Alliance. It included Preble Street. Um, and, and out of that task force came a plan that sadly sat after the council approved it and accepted it and sent it to committees for action, kind of sat for um, until about 2016 when we raised it at Health and Human Services. And, and John said to me at the time, I said, look, we really need to fix this facility and we need to get moving on this stuff. And he said to me, this is gonna be really politically charged. Are you up for that? And I said, I, we have to do it. And so he and I have been really, um, and, and tons of other people, obviously, but just really digging in on this. And there is a plan and it does have community support of, of all of the providers, maybe minus one in the city of Portland. Um, and it really, you know, regional support too, because we've talked about it at Metro Regional Coalition. Honestly, it needs funding. And I just hope that instead of coming out of here today and saying, we really need to study this and figure it out, we recognize that we have studied it and we do have a solution and we just need to bite the bullet and move forward with it. We don't need new solutions. We know what it is that we have to do. So that task force report is available. Um, I can, I'll, I'll stick the link in the Q&A and, and people can take a look, but please let's not reinvent the wheel and have another task force because there was a second task force after that. That's the action the council chose to take. I don't need another task force. I need, I need us to do the solution. So thanks. Thank you. And um, the perfect place for that link would actually be the chat because I think okay. everybody can see it in the chat, which would be okay. great. So thank you, but we'll make sure that we get that sent out to everybody as well. But for those of you who wanna access it earlier. Um, 
Great, so we have a question on the Q&A um, from Janice DeLima, which says, can changes to land use ordinances help reduce the cost of housing and positively impact supply? For example, enabling multifamily housing in single family zones or reducing road frontage minimums. Who would like to take that one? Um, I would suggest Belinda Ray, uh, since we <laughs> have been kind of talking about that. And... Oh, sh shoot, I was trying to post in the chat. I'm sorry, I think I missed the question. <laughs> so the question was related to land use ordinances, oh. which could help reduce the cost of housing and positively impact sub supply, like multifamily housing in single family zones, things like that. Oh, absolutely. And Dana would obviously be really good on this too. Um, but in, in Portland, we have been really trying to upzone to make sure that we are allowing for denser development. And I, oh, that's my dog. I'm sorry if he's making a lot of noise. Um, uh, I know that other communities within the Metro Regional Coalition, we did a, um, a resolution that five of the seven communities signed on to saying that we were going to try to increase housing in the region by a certain percentage by a certain time and and one of the things people really need to do in these other communities is allow for smaller lot sizes for the houses um, because if your minimum lot size is two acres you can you know for a single family home it doesn't allow the density that we need to build the housing that we need for this region uh, so, so land use policy is absolutely front and center on this. And I know Dana can add a ton to that. Um, I'll add, add a little bit. Um, clearly, the more units you can put on a, a piece of land, um, the, the we're trying to get that cost per unit down. So if, if you can put 50 units versus 30 units, then, then you've saved, saved some money. Uh, land's a pretty small part, um, though, at the end of the day, of, of our total development. So Portland has done some, some great things, and uh, we have a project now, Wessex Woods, out on Outer Brighton Avenue, across from a uh, 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 Chevy uh, dealership. And uh, that was due to some zone changes, that it wasn't so much of just the zoning improvements that uh, allowed greater density, but zoning changes that makes land that otherwise wouldn't have been available for residential housing available. Uh, uh, Portland is largely developed. There isn't a lot of land available. So anything that sort of makes something that not be um, feasible for, for residential, now feasible for residential uh, uh, helps. And so uh, zoning is a big piece of, of uh, our work. And, and I gotta say, Portland has been uh, incredibly um, progressive and, and helpful in making the zoning changes over the years. Um, similarly, uh, South Portland has done some, some really cool things that when we've had zoning issues there, when we've done some work in the Portland, uh, in, the, in the West End by uh, Brick Hill, um, the changes have been really, really helpful. So uh, land use is a big part of what we do. It helps some with, with cost, but it also just makes sites that otherwise weren't uh, available, now available. Uh, Liz, Liz if, you, if you don't mind, I wanted to tag on to what Dana uh, was mentioning uh, as an example of how we can collaborate, like a municipality uh, can collaborate with uh, an Avesta. Uh, Dana, you may wanna talk a little bit about our partnership out at the Barron Center uh, with the assisted living facility that we've been kind of working on that is a comprehensive approach the city owns the property, uh, but we've made it available to Avesta. Uh, we did the same thing with Community Housing of Maine to um, add 49 more units of affordable housing here in the city. So cities and towns can uh, make this so much easier um, on developers uh, by putting their land or their properties into uh, into the mix and reducing the cost of, of that. So Dana, I, Sorry to interrupt, Liz, but I just thought that that was important for the because we have so many cities and towns uh, it, tuning in. It it is a great um, uh, it's a it's a great relationship, and the way Portland has um, worked with us on on the Barron Center, where we see there's room out there, and um, you know our notion is could we do a 
housing first development for a senior population. And when they need to transition out of the uh, uh, housing first development, they can go next door to the Barron Center or there's a facility there that serves persons with Alzheimer's or, or dementia. And so that campus just felt ideal. And so we sort of shared the idea with, with John and his, his staff and we're still trying to figure out how to get the money to pay for those services, which is, uh, you know, the hard part. It's kind of goes back to sort of what I said at the beginning, you know, people need services, clearly they do for these types of facilities, um, but it's a, it's a great base. And I got to say a lot of communities um, are making old schools, um, uh, excess land available for affordable housing. Great, thank you. And, and sort of, um, you just sort of uh, broaden the lens a little bit back up to, to the statewide look. And so Dan, I'm, I'm wondering, we have a question here. Uh, can you talk about um, the connection and the difference between the 12 to 1400 individuals experiencing homelessness in, in Maine versus the 20,000 units of affordable housing that, um, that Dana uh, mentioned earlier. The, the, the 20,000 need? Sorry, yes. Yeah, the yeah. I mean, so um, the numbers are, are stark, right? But what we try and do is, is um, we've got some particularly on the production side, I'm glad Dana brought that up because we, we had such a, a wonderful year uh, last year in terms of some fundamental support from our state leaders at the legislature with the passage of the state low-income housing tax credit, which is an incredible tool that we can now put to use. Um, we're on target this year, 250 or 300 units a year is not enough. It's not enough for those 1,200 people. It's not enough for the state of Maine. Uh, this year, we're going to be getting close to 300 units. We're going to be over 500 units next year. The following year, we'll be up around 700. These, these projects take a couple of years to put through, but with, with the resources that we've been given, we're able to knock away at that, uh, at, at that number. Um, there is a, the, the folks that are at the zero to 30% income levels really need a rental assistance voucher. Uh, there's not enough rental assistance in our state or in our, in our, our, our uh, from the federal government. So we need to, the more uh, resources we can get to, to, help, uh, to help those folks. That's usually where uh, someone who's experiencing homeless, if they can get into a situation where they get the wraparound services we've been talking about, whether it be through the shelter or housing first or what have you, the first thing they're going to likely use is a voucher of some sort. So we need more of those. And we need to continue the momentum that we have uh, on the production side. Next, next year, by the end of next year, there'll be over 350 new units in Cumberland County. That's already under construction right now. There's several that are gonna be finishing up in early 21. So there is a momentum that has been built up thanks to uh, the leaders uh, at, at uh, this, you know, was the one bill that worked its way through unanimously through both houses and the governor's signature. And that was great. And now we got to put that, that to use. So there's the connection. It's all linked. The person experiencing homeless needs rental assistance, needs more units. We need more supply. And we're trying to be, uh, yeah, we, we can look at 20,000 and get discouraged, but we want to look at what we, the path that we are on um, that, that will help that. Um, I guess just two other thoughts, because I thought Belinda made a great point. Portland has done a tremendous amount of planning and thought that has gone to where they are right now. And, and I think when we, I look from a statewide perspective at trying to engage with other communities around the state, other regions, uh, a lot of the work that's been done in Portland is an example of, of what other communities can and, and should be looking at. So, um, and lastly, at the, on the, on the um, uh, regulation side, um, Representative Fecto has a bill to take some of these ideas about how municipal leaders can, can affect their local policies that will help affordable housing throughout the entire state. So again, there's a lot of good examples that Dana and John have, have put out there through Portland and South Portland and others 
And uh, we're just looking to try and take those to a statewide approach and see what we can do, so. Thank you. So, um, you know, there are a couple comments on um, our Q&A from Kenneth Capron, and, and most of them are around the idea of sort of creative and, and innovative approaches. And one of the comments relates to the malls plan, which I know GP Cog was played a big part in, in um, getting that designed. Would anyone like to comment on those innovative approaches, um, changes to, to um, current usage and how those can help with housing? I'll, I'll, uh, I'm not sure how helpful I'm gonna be, but um, we have been in some discussions, I've been in some national discussions of how do you repurpose malls? And uh, if, the, the, the buildings don't fit at all. There's no windows, there's no, they just don't work. And so it's, uh, it's not a good, good match. Um, the, the fact that there is excess parking, I think is a pretty creative thing that from what I was reading about this, this study on the uh, main mall is that it, it is, I think, um, it would be a step up to have uh, housing combined and closer to retail in, in general. I think the Rock Row folks in, in Westbrook and having that combination of residential and, and retail um, from the get-go makes, makes more sense. But uh, looking at that building, and, and there's a lot of folks kind of saying, can you hollow it out? Can you do this? Can you do that? It's, it's much easier to build on raw land than it is to try to retrofit anything out there. Um, but then you quickly get into utilities and sewer and water and, and, and things. And so there may be some potential there, but again, uh, housing oftentimes we're not, we can't compete with uh, a credit union. We can't compete with a, a coffee shop. They're able to pay more for land than, than we can. And so um, the way things stand now, it's, it's going to be hard. If, if I could, there's one other thing that um, uh, Councillor Ray and I uh, a week or two ago were debating into the wee hours of the night about this missing, missing, missing whatever. And, and it finally has become clear to me um, when I say missing middle, when I say missing, I'm thinking who's missing out on housing? Who are the people that are missing housing? And in my mind, it's the lowest of the income. Um, in Councilor Ray's head, it's who are the missing people that we don't have enough of. And so um, I, I agree entirely. We need more middle income people um, that, that we are missing that population. But I was looking at it through a who's missing the housing. And, and um, so finally, the dots have connected with me uh, in my head, uh, Councilor Ray. Sorry for being slow. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, if I can just comment on that quickly. Dana sent me a great chart the other night. We really are incredible geeks. And um, so it was, it was the chart actually that he shared today. And I was saying, oh, I see what you're saying about who's most burdened. But now do you see what I'm saying? The middle is missing. Because if you look at that chart, there are about 40,000 households that either earn less than 60% or more than 100%. And there are only 10,000 households in the middle. And so what that says to me is what we've seen in um, Metro Regional Coalition studies that we've looked at, that the middle is moving. And, and we know that they're moving to places where the housing is cheaper, but then they incur the transportation costs and start to contribute to our lack of sustainability. So, you know, the land use and the transportation all goes hand in hand, but but um, what I ultimately said to Dana is obviously we need more of all kinds of housing, and and I'm I'm glad that he and others are are part of that solution. Great, thank you. And um, I think you know that complexity, right, of the issue. You pull you you pull one thread, and all of a sudden you see um, a whole bunch of unraveling. Um, if we're not really thoughtful in these approaches. And Dan, I was wondering, you know, you mentioned the, the Statewide Homeless Council. Can you tell us sort of what they're charged with, how they're looking at these comprehensive issues 
um, related to, um, you know, what makes people homeless to begin with and how we're tackling that at the same time we're providing roofs over people's heads? Sure. Um, you know, I think we've alluded to it. I think, Liz, in your opening, you alluded to the fact that uh, one of the root causes of homelessness is uh, it's public health issues. Right. It's it's yes, there's a lack of there's a lack of inventory and, and we've already talked about the poverty rate. So that that's kind of fundamental to just economics and the supply and demand. But, um, uh, you know, more often those those that are professionals in the homeless world will tell you that uh, matters of public health, substance abuse and um, uh, mental illness and other types of things that are just so rampant. So uh, I think uh, our ability to engage with, um, uh, from Commissioner Lambrew through her whole team and get those uh, folks at the Statewide Homeless Council discussion has been incredibly helpful. They, they've got, uh, these are folks that are, are coming on board and, and taking new positions and uh, over the last year and, and really engaging at a level that I haven't seen. So that's, that's a nice thing. Statewide Homeless Council is working to address this issue of how can we take a different approach, uh, maybe through a regional approach uh, throughout the state? And when I talk about regions, I'm talking about, for example, the greater Portland would be a region, like this discussion today, it would be a region. And this is the type of, this is an example of the kinds of discussions regions need to have. So what do those regions look like? Does this make sense? Uh, who, how do you go about this? Uh, we've engaged some help with the Corporation for Supportive Housing that has worked with states before at a macro level about how to go ahead and address the issue of homelessness. And so those deliberations and those discussions are taking place now. There was even a meeting this morning where this, this uh, issue continued to get, uh, get advanced. Um, the goal is maybe coming out of this, there will be an understanding that, you know what, maybe we can have a more regional approach. And, you know, there are eight public health centers around the state that are established. That seems to make some sense in terms of let's look at the public health experts, let's look at the service providers, uh, the organizations like the Avestas of the world that are in various other communities, um, community action agencies, public housing authorities, hospitals. Um, all the nonprofit social service center providers in a particular region. There's an awful lot of resources going into various regions around the state, but are they being utilized as effectively as they can? Now, as you know, the nature of this discussion today, uh, Portland's gone well down that road uh, of, of where they're at. From my perspective at a statewide level, um, you know, there, there are opportunities in other regions that should they be able to form a more cohesive and efficient uh, system within their region, maybe 46% of people, uh, that number would drop uh, and they would receive services in their local community and they wouldn't be heading into Portland or to Bangor or to Lewiston. So um, that is a process that's ongoing and we're gonna continue to work with them and see where it goes, uh, more long-term thinking. And Dan, would it be fair to say that similar to challenges with juvenile justice issues that it's not only to sort of alleviate the pressures on the larger service centers, but it, doesn't research also show that people do better when served in their local communities? I think so, yeah. And, and you know, but, but this, this um, you know, this uh, discussion needs to involve the correctional correction officials in local communities. It needs to involve the schools. Um, all, all of the folks in the region that care about other humans, uh, they're out there. They're in every single region of the state. Um, and, and the more we can engage them as a group around their particular region will lead to perhaps a better outcome uh, than we've been experiencing uh, even pre-pandemic. The pandemic just brought it to the forefront much quicker, but it's always been out there. Thank you. Um, we had a couple uh, questions specifically on, on some more detail, Dana, related to supportive housing. Um, so Nat Tupper says, you mentioned costs for construction and operations at two, oh, I, it looks like Nat's being brought in. So maybe Nat would like to ask his question directly. Oh, darn. 
Hi, Dana. Thank you all for your your work today and always. I, I was curious, you, you had kind of broken down and I know they were very rough round costs for a, a unit cost for construction of a new unit for a, for a household. And you mentioned it was around $6,000 a year as sort of a benchmark cost to maintain that uh, from everything from utilities to maintenance of the building, et cetera. But then you said, yeah, but the tough nut to crack and the really hard part is that kind of supportive help that comes in currently from Preble Street Resource Center staff or others. Uh, and I tried on my own to do a little bit of math, trying to guess how many staff people and what they would get paid. But do you have a sort of a benchmark for that? Because it, it seems like to me, people who are not next door to the issue don't uh, are, are, are compassionate and willing to help and maybe there's a way to do some fair share allocations to help out with people uh, needing the support that they need. And the housing construction and maintenance is a separate matter and needs to be addressed. But if, if we haven't addressed that other issue, and I, you know, I just did my math and I'm sure it's wrong. It's, it's $4,000, you know, if I averaged it out. Well, gosh, um, if that's true, and it's maybe not, uh, you know, a lot of folks just being, calculus would tell them, oh, I could help people at where they are, or I could pay to have those families here in my community and educate them and take care of them and do all that sort of stuff. And it just seems like crass math would say, it makes sense for us to work together and do some fair sharing. So I'll, I'll uh, it's dangerous to throw out numbers here that, I mean, it's, it's Preble Street that operates um, these, that provides the support of these three housing first numbers, uh, housing first developments. But I would say it is in the six hundred thousand dollars a year range. It's about seventy dollars per person per night um, to provide this support. Um, you know, I think I can't remember years ago it might have been on that task force, John, or someplace else. I think we it was like thirty thirty five dollars a night maybe at the um, uh, for, for people staying at the shelter. Uh, you add the meals to that, and maybe it's more, but um, I, I'm going to say it's about $70 a night. That's a very rough number. And, and just to sort of, and I think that might get to Senator Breen's um, uh, question too, if I, I think that was tucked in there. Um, you know, we also run some, we, we operate 75 State Street and we have a, a, a assisted living facility in, in Gorham. So when we're providing uh, assisted living or supportive housing for seniors where we're providing meals and, and, and support there, it's around $150 uh, a night or so. If you ramp it back up to nursing home care, it's three, $400. So, you know, there's, there's some pretty well established uh, costs per night, cost per day levels of care. And um, I think probably uh, that's a good challenge for us to get our arms around that number because this isn't the language that Dan and I normally talk when we talk about housing. We talk about different things. We're not talking about the cost of care, but when we go over to DHHS and start talking to them about, well, can you bring some resources? They want to talk cost per cost of care per day. So anyway, in, in my mind, it's probably in the housing first, it's probably around $70. And, and in, in all of this, if you serve a less needy group, you'd have less staff and it might bring them down to $40, $50. Um, so it all, obviously the level of care um, is, is directly relates to the um, level of needs of, of the population you serve. Great, thanks. And um, it seems we have a question from Mike Foley as well. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. It's more comment rather than a question. Uh, just wanted to um, kind of echo some of the comments that Nat and others have made regarding cost sharing. Um, but before that, I just wanted to quickly mention, you know, in Westbrook, we've done, um, I'm actually the mayor of Westbrook, and we've done a lot of the work regarding uh, the zoning changes that we've talked about early on to increase the density in our 
in our core. So that's accessible by public transit and things of that nature. So we're starting to see after making those changes last year, some projects come in, but we're, uh, we're looking to the future. Um, you know, we've, we've added a lot of residential units, but we're looking to the future with groups like Rock Row and other developments trying to add a significant amount of housing units to the region, not necessarily specifically um, affordable housing or, or housing that we're needing to help with homelessness. But I think that um, from a community standpoint, having served my community nearly two decades, we've been talking about the homelessness issue for a while. And Portland always has been the group that has to bear that burden. And unfortunately, it's not just a city of Portland issue, it's a regional issue. And we should be working together through uh, through like a cost sharing arrangement like Annette talked about, or something like, for instance, like county government, you know, county government took on responsibilities of many regional things over, you know, hundreds of years, one of which was the county jail system, there used to be municipal jails, and they have a county jail It happens to be located in Portland. But we should maybe be exploring with the county government to potentially have a county homeless shelter and the homelessness affects our entire county it affects our entire organization or organizations and it could be spread amongst all the towns and cities uh, in Cumberland County in a more affordable fashion for everyone. So it's not just one community bearing that burden and it could be held in Portland or Westbrook or South Portland or someplace that's convenient and appropriate. Um, but it's definitely something that we should explore in the future. And there's other models such as the Greater Portland Transit District with cost sharing for public transit, Eco Main with cost sharing for trash and recycling. So there's different initiatives out there that get the region to cooperate and we should be doing that more in this instance. And I think ultimately county government should be the solution and the answer. Great. Well, um, I have often said things like that myself and others on this call. Um, you know, we, we are, our, our fortunes rise and fall with each other. We know we are a region. We know what happens in one community impacts the others. Thank you so much for that. Um, I want to thank all, I think we're, we're going to wrap up now um, and I'm going to turn it back over um, to Amy, but I just want to thank um, everyone so much uh, for your great questions. And it's uh, been a pleasure to share them here. Thank you so much, Liz, and to all the panelists and the attendees for this really engaging conversation. I hope it will um, spark continued discussion back in all of your own um, communities. And please remember that GPCOG is available to municipalities to help you explore regional and local actions on homelessness. So um, again, thank you everyone for coming. I wish you a good day and stay well.